Okay, cool. All right. So, um, hi, and uh, thanks for that opportunity to letting me speak here. Actually, um, I had the opportunity to hang out with Eric a couple of months ago, and um, he told me that um, he is uh, planning to revive the WebPerf meetup in Hamburg, and that made me super duper happy um, because, yeah, I've been um, involved in the first couple of meetups when uh, the meetup scene first came to Germany, and we founded these uh, Cologne and we Hamburg WebPerf meetups. And so seeing it revived after COVID gets me really, really excited. Um, so, and then I then he asked, what would you like to talk about? And I was actually dabbling with web page test at that very moment. And I thought, okay, you don't want to do another images talk. So uh, let's talk about something else. And then I looked at my screen. So oh, it's web page test. So I, I just said, I'm going to talk about some exciting web page test scripting. And that's how that um, talk title came about. So um, yeah, first time doing this talk. Um, let's see how this goes. So in case um, in case you wonder who's talking, um, I'm Tobias, and I've been building web stuff since 1999, I figured. Um, that was my first website. Ugh. And uh, Firefox was still called differently back then. And um, yeah, I've been doing WebPerf since 2011 for um, TKIX, so the world's largest peering exchange, Akamai CDN, and for the last seven years, Trivago. And um, yeah, I've been maintaining in some kind of web page test instance also for the last 10 years of that. Um, I think most people have by now flagged me as an images guy because I mostly talk about image performance, but not today. So um, before I deep dive into, uh, into web page test scripting, I thought I'm, I'm gonna do a, a three minute roundup of what web page test actually is and how it came about. So um, web page tests idea actually originates from uh, Yahoo's exceptional performance team, where most of the very famous people of the web performance community uh, originate. And uh, the idea of having a system to automatically test for performance stems from back then. Uh, many of these people then switched to Google and that is where uh, Pat Meehan actually got time and energy enough to continue building that system. And um, after a couple of years, it kind of looks like it kind of looked like this. So, um, in case you wonder about if you ever do anything professional enough, uh, remember Pat's cellar. So, um, what you see here is um, Pat's uh, own web page test setup because at the beginning he mostly was running everything from his own home. Um, so, this is his server and mobile testing setup back then. It became um, more professional over time though. He started publishing um, images, uh, so machine images with which you could run your own web page test instance. And uh, the community also picked up building web page test drivers for mobile devices. So this is actually a screenshot that I found just today. And I thought this is so cool, I'm gonna put this in here because this is from my own web page test server that I was running in 2013. Um, this is how it looked back then. You can see it by the screen resolution, which fascinating times this was. So yeah, we were we were basically um, like um, the first settlers, you know, like thinking about where we can where can we find some gold, and uh, we were thinking about how to uh, route mobile devices to run web page test uh, mobile clients more efficiently. We were pulling up mobile three um, G hotspots in order to emulate three G testing reliably in a data center. It was fun times. It was really good. Um, web page test is an open source project at some points looked like that. So, okay, this is already a, a more modern screenshot because of stuff like the spoff on the custom tab. But this is basically the web interface that most of you have probably seen if they've ever used web page test in the last 10 years. Um, you enter a URL, you configure some settings, you hit start test, and you're good to go. Um, because the community was so active, um, this kind of setup with this web interface actually grew quite quickly and you could choose different locations. Um, it's um, it, it, per default, it always ran uh, from Dallas where a pet lived. Um, but um, at some point you could even find servers in Germany and in Poland and in Singapore provided either by companies like Backend or even by uh, intrepid uh, uh, private people who just wanted to contribute to this community and provided a public server from which you could run tests. Some of these machines were then 
very, very busy because they were popular locations, especially Asia. Um, and some locations were not so popular. So it was it was a bit of a, of a, of a um, chase to find a machine that is close to where you wanted to test from that was not too busy so that your test would appear at some point. So that network grew out of yeah, an entrepreneurial spirit from people. But at some point, it had to become more professional. So in um, 2014, uh, Mark Zeman from New Zealand um, actually announced that he would, um, Mark is a designer, and he announced that web page test wasn't making nice graphs and that he would build a product where you could have a hosted instance of web page test and have nice dashboards on top because people like, like looking at nice things. So this is how speed, care, how speed curve was born. Um, quite soon after that announcement, um, he managed to, to land a coup and get Steve Souders to uh, come to the speed curve team. So leaving Google and uh, joining speed curve. And uh, that got very many people excited about speed curve. And I think also gave web page just a huge boost because it suddenly was a, was a SaaS product that you could easily acquire and start your own testing. And it wasn't so complicated to maintain all this web page test server um, and uh, headless browsers and maybe even mobile devices anymore. But you could actually just buy this off the shelf. And that was, that was really nice. Um, over time, Speed Curve actually acquired a really decent team. So um, Tammy, for example, is fantastic. If you've ever read any of uh, Tammy's books or blog posts, it's brilliant. Um, Andy Davies is now there and Cliff Cocker. So they've got a really good team over there by now. I'm, I'm happy about how that product has grown. Um, more recently now, in 2020, Catchpoint announced that it would um, take over a web page test because Pat had been developing web page tests on his own without proper funding for over a decade now. And he was always thinking about how to ensure the future of the project. And um, with uh, Catchpoint in the mix, there is now a dedicated team that develops web page test further and also provides it as a hosted solution. So they can basically like with speed curve, um, not having to worry about how to run this by yourself. Um, by now, there are because of these splits to um, products that are hosting web page tests, there are a bit of concerns about if these products still contribute enough to upstream and when certain learnings are being merged back into the open source version, who provides machine images to host web page test yourself in case privacy or you just want to do this. Um, so these concerns exist, but the project is still alive. You can still do this. So now that we talked a little bit about the history of web page test, let's see how to run this. So in the very, very basic, um, uh, configuration, you would go to some some version of web page test, be it yourself open source hosted version that I've shown you in the previous screenshots or something like this, how a web page tests web interface looks now. You would paste a, your domain you want to test, select the location, maybe even a browser and just click test. Um, that is the most basic usage you would you would do. However, this of course has lots of downsides, right? It's a, it's a one-off test. You don't have a stable baseline to compare to. Um, the test is probably not tuned to the needs that you actually have. The test results might not be so reliably, reliable depending on the data center, network health in that vicinity, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to do, use web page test in a more advanced setting, you need to consider a couple of things. Um, one of the many things you might want to consider is how many tests to run? And there's actually been some uh, some research on this in 2016 in the web page test and the web perf calendar. And the uh, the short answer is you really want to run just about nine tests. Um, the reason for this is that nine tests give you a stable median with a variance below six percent for most of the of the performance metrics that you might care about. So if you run web page test, don't run it once, run it nine times, let it pick the median. It picks the median by default now if you just click through the, uh, through the tables and look at the topmost table results. Um, it actually used to take the average, that's a bit sad, uh, but now it picks the median, yay. So less outliers. Um, another thing you might really wanna um, hammer in is a good labeling. I think this is one thing where web page test as an open source system still sucks which is why I gave you a screenshot of um, speed curve actually here. Because if, if you run multiple tests over time every day on your product, especially in an AB scenario, 
you will want to come up with a system that enables you to quickly find the pages that you're looking for because you've labeled them correctly. Here, for example, I, um, I show you how I'm running things uh, as a short excerpt. So those are not all the tests, just something to, to get you started. Um, I create eight tests that are my baseline tests. They um, contain most of the user journey and um, also from different locations. And I then also run B tests to compare against. And I also have some um, small uh, SPA steps, as you can see in the slide out gallery, slide out overview. I'll show you how to trigger these in a few minutes. So running enough tests and labeling them correctly in order to be able to find your data, this is really critical. But I've called this, um, I've called this presentation exciting web page test scripting, not exciting click buttons in a web interface. So. Let's actually look at the scripting capabilities of web page tests, how to create a stable baseline. Um, there are some trick, twig, tricks and tweaks that you will see in the, in the upcoming script that will enable you to create a stable baseline over time and rely on those results because that is important. So for the next couple of slides, we'll go through this script um, step by step. Um, the, not, the first thing that I wanna show you is the set user agent setting. Um, why is this important? Because if you don't define a user agent, web page test will identify itself as web page test and also suffix uh, itself with a PTST in order to be able uh, for you to drill down into traffic that has only uh, been caused by web page test in your log delivery services. However, um, there are plenty of good reasons to customize that user agent. Number one might be, that uh, you might be running some kind of device characterization, maybe on the edge, maybe on your origin, um, something like the Warful database, um, where you then trigger certain features depending on the user agent. If you know that you're doing that, you might wanna make sure that the um, user agent is set in a way that it is accepted by your device characterization system. Otherwise it might fall to, I don't know, bot, and then you get tar pitted depending on how you've set things up. So customizing user agent might just be a, a, good, a good hygiene. Um, it might also help you, however, uh, to um, whitelist your traffic. I'll um, show you another one, how to whitelist your traffic in a, in a few minutes, but one actually might simply be uh, the user agent. So if you don't do any other handshake mechanism, um, setting a user agent that helps you identify the traffic. And if you have some firewalls, bot detection mechanisms, you might want to whitelist that specific user agent. The next ones um, I'm going to talk about quickly because they're speaker specific, because in web page tests, open source variant, you don't have a scripted mechanism to do this. You only can do this in the GUI. Um, one is to make sure that the user agent string does not get tainted by the appendance of PTST in the string. So this is the first one, prevent the user agent string change. And the other one is uh, purge all certificate caches. Um, if you want to maintain a baseline as clean as possible, you wanna make sure that every time the test runs, the web page test agent that is being driven has not just ex uh, for, uh, by accident targeted that exact URL before and has a, has a warm cache uh, all of a sudden for the SSL certificates. Because if it does, um, then your test results might have too much fluctuation to be meaningful. So to make sure that you are basically as cold cache as possible, always clear certs. Um, like I said, another thing that you might need to do is to set some kind of um, authentication mechanism to get through your DDoS defenses. We've actually had that in the past um, that web page test was deliberately being targeted um, or considered as a bot. So you might want to think of a way that ensures that your security team is confident in letting web page test through. A uh, secret that you can ship here is probably good enough for most uh, real world use cases. Then another thing that has um, appeared recently is um, the issue with DNS. Um, why, is that, why is that an issue? Um, DNS actually fluctuates over time. And uh, DNS might also uh, sometimes, just like with SSL certs, be warm or cold. And um, if you've ever worked in a scenario where you have alerting for people, either be it a Slack channel that just says that there's a problem with a bot or that somebody actually gets an email or even gets alerts on their phone, 
um, then you want to make sure that the alerting is as meaningful as possible. And to ensure that the alerting for performance is as meaningful as possible, it must not fluctuate. So if, I, if there ever has been somebody doing on-call duty and getting awoken in the middle of the night, um, because the web page the web page just screamed that the site is slow and they're losing money and it turned out to be faulty because of some fluctuation in the data they will ignore this the next time so you can burn people super quickly with alerts that are meaningless therefore getting your baseline as stable and reliable as possible is very important the trick to do this with the dns part of the equation is to pre-resolve uh, the dns and make sure that it's always warm because we cannot guarantee that it's always cold because DNS is such a multifaceted system which might be cached in different parts of the operating system, but we can make sure that it's always warm. So what we're doing here is we're pre-resolving the DNS so that it is never part of the equation, at least not for the baseline test. Unless, of course, you can create a B-test where you deliberately disable that feature and see how much your DNS fluctuates over time. But for the A test, for the A comparison, I would highly recommend that you pre-resolve DNS. The next part is um, you might want to, not just might, you definitely want to block third parties. Um, there are two ways of doing this. The way that I've seen recommended in the past is to use Blocked in, don't block domains except, which I've uh, written down in that comment line over there. However, um, that is basically a whitelisting approach or an allow listing approach. Sorry, I should have called it allow listing. Allow listing approach uh, where you only write down the domains that you expect um, the assets to come from that you need for your own website. However, I've um, experienced in the past that this actually blindsides you to certain um, problems that your site might be facing over time. So um, I've turned that around and I'm now only using block domains and I deliberately block the domains that I do not want to be activated and then hope, well not just hope, I make sure it's hygiene, that these cover all the third parties that I might want to have blocked. So I've, I've, as an example, I've brought you Google Tag Manager. I mean, who wants that in the waterfall? Uh, double click for ads and then for example one of these third party um, cookie overlays because yeah, getting getting a cookie overlay banner that is legally compliant in 60 different countries is a lot of trouble therefore uh, many companies outsource that now and buy something so if you want to get rid of all of that stuff you will want to block these domains so they don't get loaded and only things that are under your direct control um, appear in the waterfall diagram for your baseline test. This becomes necessary uh, specifically using block domains and not block domains except if you are in a company that has many teams working on the same code base and doing many deployments every day. Because what you can then do is you can see um, the, um, outliers that suddenly appear. So you could actually set an alert on um, if your JavaScript bundle size goes too large, your image size suddenly jumps too much, um, because you can reliably say that every outlier that suddenly spikes is probably an addition of a host that has not been present before. Therefore, in terms of alerting again and making alerts meaningful, I would recommend that you use block domains and block domains actively instead of relying on block domains accept and its allow list. Another one is um, you might want to consider um, a viewport that is meaningful for your user base. Maybe you only run a mobile website nowadays and you don't even care about desktop anymore. Um, or you want to run multiple viewports. I'll show you uh, a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, here I've just um, uh, come up with a good guesstimation about a DPR2 uh, WQ HD plus laptop screen viewport. So it's basically a MacBook, 2019 MacBook uh, viewport minus all the browser Chrome that uh, that is being lost. So this is really just the browser viewport, not the window size, and also not the resolution of the screen. Um, web page test until, I don't know how long, maybe a couple of years, not that long actually still was using two, uh, 1024 as a default, which was way too low for a modern age. 
Then they switched it to 1,366, which is still not, in my opinion, a decent viewport guesstimate. So I came up with this one for a decent desktop test. Um, then, uh, in theory, this should always be the very last um, piece of any web page test script is the navigate command. This one then navigates to the URL that you want to test. In, in a speed curve scenario or in a web page test um, scenario, this will then take what you've entered in the URL form on the, uh, on the web app. Uh, you can, of course, hard code a URL here. You don't have to use the variables. Um, once the uh, navigation has, has been completed, you can actually still execute stuff. For example, here I'm executing a console log to maybe lock a certain um, object value that I want to um, retrieve later, or you can set a custom performance mark with the uh, browser API so that you can lock something meaningful for yourself later. So this is the baseline script. Now I'm gonna go into a couple of extra settings um, that will um, show you options that you might do for either to tweak your baseline or that you could run as B tests. The first one will be because Eric already mentioned LCPs and, uh, and viewports and lazy loading. This is about the LCP. Um, here I uh, brought you what I, like I defined the desktop viewport, I commented out on top, but also now a mobile viewport. This is a relatively okay mobile viewport in 2023 right now. Um, why do you want to run multiple of these tests? Um, because actually LCP, for example, one of the P core web vitals is actually not always the same depending on, uh, depending on which device you look at. Actually, your website, even every single step in your user journey probably has five to 10 different LCP elements depending on screen resolution and um, the uh, browser preloader logic, so it depends on the browser engine that's accessing the page. And maybe if you will take third parties into consideration, also what the third parties are shipping right now and which priority decisions the browser preloader then makes based on these third parties. So maybe there is a ad that suddenly overlays things. Maybe an accessibility overlay, by the way, which are horrible, um, gets triggered. Maybe the uh, cookie banner is your LCP element on desktop, but not on mobile. So you might want to consider which, which buckets of users you might have in terms of viewport size and run tests for each of these and then check which LCP element gets identified and optimize for those because they might be very different and surprisingly different. So another reason why you might want to change your viewport size is lazy loading. You could do something crazy like this. Here is another set viewport size commented out on top. But as you can see here, I've just multiplied my desktop viewport by 10 and I'll thereby emulate a crazy, impossibly high vertical browser window. Why do I do that? Because I will force that everything in some kind of product overview page um, is suddenly in the viewport and therefore is forced to be loaded. That is one approach to maybe check that contents are actually loaded or maybe you just wanna measure how many images um, in total a user is, is exposed to in terms of byte size when they have looked at the entire page overview page. Maybe you wanna log that, maybe you wanna alert on this. So um, forcing an artificially oversized vertical viewport might be one way to force all this um, below the fold content to get loaded. Another trick that you could use for this is actually making the, um, uh, the headless browser artificially scroll. There, therefore, you could use something like the exit and exec and wait statement. And here we just scroll by the height of one viewport every second. So that at the end of the day, we arrive at the, unless you have infinite loading at the bottom of the page and your artificial browser from web page test should have at this point force loaded all the async and lazy loaded content that were below the fold for the first viewport. Again, this is an opportunity to alert if all the lazy loading is working correctly, if the headers are being sent correctly. So this is something that you can do to ensure that your lazy loading is set up correctly all over your site. Another thing you can do with web page test scripting is actually toggle or opt in to A-B tests. 
So let's say that you have an AB test provider. You All you might need to do is set a cookie, which is the first example. So with set cookie, you might really just um, be you know, on the easy side of opting into a B test and force web page test to access that B test. So you've got something to compare against. Um, another thing you could do, if you know that one of the tests you want to run is a browser feature, is you can force toggle certain browser features on or off. Here, for example, I'm shipping the AVIF accept header to make sure that when my um, test is accessing my server, my server actually sees that this browser is supporting AVIF and then ships AVIF back to them. Therefore, that enables me to then run maybe an uh, WebP to AVIF image comparison. Um, you can also do this with uh, Broccoli, for example. You could uh, force enable Broccoli or force disable Broccoli and see how your um, B-test compares to your baseline. Another thing that Eric also already mentioned is the pre-loading, pre-connecting. Um, here you could, for example, exec a function that, um, that executes pre-connect against certain third-party origins that you might need. As an example here, I brought you a Sentry for JavaScript error logging and uh, the Google Web Fonts um, CDN. Um, and you could then do this as a B comparison. So have web page test with that exec script active versus your baseline where it's not active and see how much performance benefits the pre-connect to these third parties might bring you. Another thing that I've already hinted at uh, that you can do with web page test scripting are uh, triggering soft navigations. So because many, 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 way too many websites nowadays are single page applications for no reason at all, um, you might want to measure a specific soft navigation inside your SPA framework. One of the ways, the very powerful way to do this is to use web page tests inbuilt lock data setting. What you can do here is basically disregard all performance metrics until you reactivate lock data again. So what you can do here is you tell web page test, navigate to a certain website, but ignore everything that you measure then wait for async resources, maybe some item rankings to, to load. Let's say you access the, pay, uh, the product overview page and there are multiple async calls being done until your search is completely satisfied. Also based on what the e-commerce store currently thinks is the adequate ranking of, the, of those product overviews. That's why there's that sleep command. And then you reactivate the performance logging again with log data, and then maybe uh, trigger an artificial click on one of the on the very first element in that product overview page, which might then bring you with a soft navigation to the product detail overview without having a hard navigation in between. Then web page test will only deliver performance metrics back to you that were part of that soft navigational step. So none of the hard navigation from the top is in your metrics, but only the assets that need to be loaded in that SPA soft navigation. That, help, that helps you to see uh, which parts of the user journey might be slow that you are not expecting. For example, if you emulate your entire conversion funnel by making web page test click through these things step-by-step step and only log each step individually, you can really create a beautiful network of how fast each of these soft navigations is until the user has converted. All right, so in case this uh, did not suffice, I also brought you a light reading list for later. First of all, of course, there are public web page test scripting docs. All of these um, are links. Um, I'll publish the slides and you can hopefully then also click on those links. Um, the other one that I highly recommend to you is Andy Davies's uh, using web page test book available on O'Reilly, of course, um, but anywhere where you decide to get your books, really. It's from 2015. So most changes that Catchpoint has now introduced th since 2021 are not in there. However, that is not a bad thing because web page tests scripting capabilities um, have not changed that much since 2015. Of course, some have, but not that much. And um, Andy has a ton of good advice in that book. Um, another one that I highly recommend you is another Brit, that is Matt Hobbs, who works for the Gov UK website. And um, he has done a series of articles about how to run web page tests. 
um, and then he has a monster article that is that is called how to run a web page test, I think, which has tons and tons of sub chapters about each step, each table, each link and what that means. Highly recommended reading. Then uh, Robin Osborne, a fantastic fellow, has uh, because of that issue with um, web page tests not only being open source anymore, wrote an up to date blog post about how to self host web page test nowadays and keep running it without needing speed curve or catch points web page test because for many companies it might not be an option to rely on a third party to host all of their performance metrics then of course there are speed curve and catch point blogs which also continue to feature good content regarding web page test and how to test and then of course for all the performance metrics consider backends on block because they keep publishing about really nice performance metric deep insights too Thank you very much, and that's it for me. Awesome, thank you so much. I hope you heard the, the end of the clapping at least when I, yeah, thank when you. I unmute it again. Awesome. I think that was, that was super useful advice. Um, maybe if there are any questions, I will just hand you the mic and you can, you can ask Toby directly. Yes, we have one from, from Felix, yeah? Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. Hi, uh, I have a quick, hi. I have a quick question uh, regarding your uh, interesting advice on uh, kind of keeping DNS out of the, the testing and clearing, on the other hand, the TLS uh, certificate cache. Because mm -hmm. one thing I'm wondering about is a special case which I quite frequently see, which is uh, certificates being not shipped with OCSP stapling, which then means the browser has to do an HTTP request, do DNS, do all that stuff before actually loading the certificate and then getting the certificate, then loading the other stuff. So do you think that's maybe something worth considering excluding as well? Or do you think it's, it's fine? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I haven't seen many web page tests that I've run actually run into that problem that they have to do the entire stack that you just described to retrieve the correct certificate. Um, so those are not so slow. Um, I am, I guess, worried about that it's um, that if you if you don't clear the cache, your fluctuations might be too high again. And maybe if you alert on it, you might alert people for no reason. However, I do see your point. Um, if OCP stapling is not working correctly, this might delay things a lot and might not reflect anything in the real world. Thanks. However, it's synthetic testing, so real world is, is debatable. <laughs> <clears throat> Any more questions? Always have to look at two audiences to make sure I don't miss someone. So we have Brian. Great talk, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, do you do any um, yeah work with the API to kick off any um, tests? Um, yeah, for um, certain builds, we use Web Page Test API for we, So in in our case, we use SpeedCurve. We use the API to trigger tests. Um, once we see a pull request having successfully created a stage machine, because we do not only want to rely on Lighthouse in that case, Lighthouse is nice and well. Um, and if you run it often enough, Lighthouse suffers from the same nine test problem as I've described our web page test. So you need to run it often enough and, and build the median. But White Lighthouse might not catch all the stuff that we want to see. So we actually trigger via speed curve, uh, speed curve, no, sorry, speed curve API. Um, the test against the stage machine once the build for that stage machine after a pull request has been completed. But uh, that's the only case that I can immediately think of. I've also pulled data via the API, um, but uh, I've done that manually so far, only when I needed it to. Another question here. Yeah, also thanks uh, from my side for the cool talk. Um, did you have any experience so far with custom matrix? Because we found out recently that's a really cool new feature to expose uh, custom matrix and custom data basically from the website. 
Um, true. That's uh, why I uh, hinted at that performance mark um, in the in the exec in one of the exec demos, um, that you can create and ship your own custom metrics. The thing that um, I found problematic with custom metrics and the code base that I've worked with so far is that because of the um, pace of change and the distributed teams that we have, that um, if you need custom marks inside your markup to be able to find out a custom metric, um, because many custom metrics rely on a certain element to be there. Um, these elements do not stay over time. So the problem that we are facing is that you create a custom metric, it relies on a certain element to be in the code base, and three months later, it's not, because somebody has accidentally removed it. And then you either have to create tests that fail for, uh, for somebody who accidentally removed that, and if, the, if then those tests are too annoying, which also sometimes happens, these get still ignored and then the, then the element is gone again. So that is, that, is, that is a constant struggle that we faced in the last couple of years that if we wanted to have a custom metric, we could only rely on it being there a couple of months until by some accident, a critical piece in the code got removed and then the custom metric could, be, could not be measured anymore. Nice. Checking with the right side audience again. Anything here? All right. Ben, thank you so much. I think you have to attend to, to, to your kids now and can't watch the, the last talk. Yeah, but right. I have to get my kids to bed. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Really cool. See you soon.